This video is brought to you by MUBI, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Try MUBI free for 30 days at MUBI.com slash CinemaTyler. Hey, remember that scene in There Will Be Blood when they hit a gas pocket causing a geyser of oil to erupt and then catch fire? I love how crazy and intense that scene is. It's pretty much the centerpiece of the movie. So how did they do it? Well, that's exactly what we're going to talk about on this episode of Making Film. Let me set the scene. We begin in 1956 with James Dean's third and last leading role as Jet in George Stevens' film Giant, following a poor handyman who has left a small piece of land on the property of Bick, a well-to-do man and his new wife, Leslie, whom Jet is in love with. The husband, Bick, tries to buy back that piece of his family's land, but Jet refuses and makes it his home. One day, Jet notices oil seeping out of a footprint on his land, and soon after, this happens. Looks sort of familiar, right? Well, Giant is one of Paul Thomas Anderson's favorite films, and like The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, it served as an inspiration while making There Will Be Blood. Who's not civilized? Fast forward to around 50 years later, during the pre-production on There Will Be Blood, Anderson was having trouble finding a shooting location that he liked. It had to look like Bakersfield, California in the early 1900s, but there was a problem. The actual oil boom had fundamentally changed the landscape of California. Producer Joanne Seller said, you can't find old California in California anymore. We were desperate to f shoot the film in California. I live in California and it's a California story, but I can honestly tell you, we, 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 we drove over every inch of that state looking for the right place to, to, to film and we couldn't find what California looked like back then in California anymore. You know, there was either oil derricks or there was a Burger King sign or a freeway or it was owned, you know, the Bureau of Land Management and that would have been impossible. So after, after searching forever, we ended up getting, um, um, just, just opening it up to other states, New Mexico, even Nevada, Colorado, wherever it would be, Mexico, um, just to find the right thing. The right thing was, what Bakersfield would have looked like before the discovery of oil. Um, and there was a certain, there was something very specific about the landscape and how it looked. Anderson was sent some photos of a ranch in a town in Texas called Marfa, and it was perfect. Not only did it have all the rocks, sand, dust, and hills they were looking for, it had its own private train line that they could use for the film. Anderson thought that the location was amazing, and as if he needed any more of a reason to shoot there, Anderson was told that this was actually the same town that Giant was filmed in. They went to Marfa to look around, but when they got there, they heard that Joel and Ethan Cohen, aka the Cohen brothers, were also scouting locations in Marfa for No Country for Old Men. Anderson said, I remember we had come down for a scout, and they were down for a scout, and I opened the door at the motel and saw Ethan Cohen. I said, this town's not big enough for the both of us, because literally it wasn't. And they had very intelligently heard about us and snapped up all the motel rooms, those sneaky bastards. They were only there for a week, and we were in pre-production so it worked out fine for everybody. But it was kind of hilarious. You might also remember that the favorites to win Best Picture at the Academy Awards that year were There Will Be Blood and No Country for Old Men. No Country for Old Men. Scott Wooten, Ethan Cohen, and Joel Cohen producing. One of the things that makes There Will Be Blood such an amazing movie is this scene where Daniel Plainview's Derek strikes oil on the Sunday Ranch. <laughs> In an interview, Anderson said that they didn't storyboard the film, but it appears that they may have just storyboarded this scene. These storyboards by Kevin McCarthy were found in the post by Cinephilia and beyond. Here we can see a breakdown of the complex first sequence of shots from H.W. being blown off the roof to Daniel rescuing him. I love the part here where it says, how close can we get? Looks pretty close. And it looks like they modified the timing a bit because we can see here that they were going to have the geyser ignite in the background of the shot of Daniel carrying H.W. away from the derrick. One of the things I really love about this scene is the powerful and unique score by Radiohead's Johnny Greenwood, which is why this episode's bonus material is a short six and a half minute video on the process of creating the music for There Will Be Blood, and why this scene actually helped disqualify Greenwood from the Best Original Score Oscar. It's yours for just a dollar and free for $5 patrons. You'll find the link in the description and at the end of the video. 
Production designer Jack Fisk designed an 80 foot tall oil derrick that was constructed and set up to spew out fake oil made from quote, the stuff they put in chocolate milkshakes at McDonald's, which seems to give yet another meaning to, I drink your milkshake. The oil was made from quote, food grade methyl cellulose, caramel color, and various dyes, but they used a couple different ratios for different effects. Special effects supervisor Steve Kremen said, you can take the same substance that looks perfect in a pool, but when you squirt it out of a tube, it may take on a brownish tinge. We had to adjust viscosity and color. We had a manufacturer in Santa Fe Springs, California mix up 200 gallon containers concentrated. Those were transferred to tanks up to 21,000 gallons. We made up to 53,000 gallons at a time. They combined the concentrated mix with a lot of water. Many of the actors had to be drenched with the fake oil, so it had to be able to wash out of costumes. Considering that the derrick would eventually catch fire in the scene, one idea was to make a derrick out of steel and cover it in a veneer that would burn away and then they could just replace the veneer and shoot more takes. This would have taken more time and money and Anderson said about the wooden derrick they had, let's just light it up and go for it. Of course, this means that they would really just have one shot at what is arguably the biggest moment in the film. It is the moment that Daniel's gamble of going to the Sunday Ranch finally pays off, but it will cost him his son's hearing and eventually their relationship. I'm going to Mexico with my wife. I'm going away from you. Daniel Day-Lewis said, I don't know how many times the burning of that bloody rig was put on the schedule. We all thought that we should do something else first because there was only one Derek, and that was the centerpiece of our world that Jack Fisk had built for us. In a way, part of it was that we didn't want to lose it as well. We knew that we'd feel the absence of that beautiful thing when it was gone. But more than that, it was a big risk. This was a big story to tell. The schedule was 60 days, which is not nothing, but it's not a long shoot either to tell that story. So it was relentless, and there was so much to do every day. While doing pyrotechnic tests for when the derrick goes up in flames, the production ended up creating a large plume of smoke that managed to ruin some of the shots that the Cone brothers were trying to get during the same time, causing them to wrap for the day. Perhaps a little accidental revenge for booking all the motel rooms. They positioned a number of cameras around the derrick, including four controlled by operators, several more in dangerous areas, some in areas that would be too hot for the crew to operate, as well as one in a firebox at the base of the derrick, and one in a crash box to capture the derrick's collapse. Special effects supervisor Steve Kremen already had some experience with this kind of effect. He was the one who made the flaming oil wells in Jarhead, and apparently they were so good, the ILM, aka Industrial Light and Magic, used those flaming wells as reference points for computer-generated fire effects on other movies. Hey, you ever seen that movie, Jack? You seen the movie, Jack? James Dean, man! My well came in, big. <laughs> My well came in, big. <laughs> According to cinematographer Robert Ellswit, the one instance of the Derrick fire that was computer generated, which was done by ILM, was the initial explosion at the top of the Derrick. Other than that, all of the fire was real. I believe he's referring to the moment the oil ignites, but it all looks real to me. Maybe he's referring to the oil breaking through the top of the Derrick. I can see the debris being computer generated. They used a mixture of petroleum products, diesel fuel, and gasoline to create the flames and they would simply modify the ratios of these three ingredients to create different effects. For instance, when the derrick was on fire during the day, they used a ratio that created more smoke. But since smoke is hard to see at night, for those shots they used a mixture that made less smoke and brighter flames. That's good. Kremen said, We made our own jet nozzle to shoot the juice through. The pumps we used were hard to find. High pressure petroleum transfer pumps that do a huge volume at huge pressure. They were powered by hydraulic motors, which eliminated the danger of creating sparks anywhere near the fluid. Using an electric pump with metallic parts can throw sparks all over the place, and the impellers aren't explosion proof, so you're taking a heck of a chance with that kind of setup. All our power was remotely activated. Even with such a complex system for the effect, there was another big problem. According to environmental regulations, they had to make sure that none of the flammable fuel could touch the ground, meaning that if actual fuel was shooting out of the derrick, it had to be on fire. Kremen said, Before we shot anything, we had to test the whole area to verify the levels of petroleum in the soil. Once we'd finished the stunt, we had to pull soil samples within a 150 foot radius of the fuel jet to prove we hadn't added petroleum to the soil. Kremen goes on to say, Because the flames had to ignite on camera, we first ran a simulated oil, 
a water-based non-toxic product that was okay to drop on the ground. That ran through one pump for a certain amount of time, and then we'd inject the other pump and safely follow the water with fuel we could ignite. We had four igniters in case any of them failed. They included electronic coils, propane poppers, pyrotechnics, and as our fourth backup, road flares below the deck. If anything shot out of the nozzle and didn't get lit, it had to go through the flares before it hit the ground. In an earlier scene, HW discovers oil seeping out of the ground and notifies Daniel who tests it by dipping a stick into the oil and lighting it on fire. That's earthquake oil, set loose. Now you'll notice that this is actually touching the ground. Well first, they dug a hole and insulated a small amount of flammable liquid from the ground. But on top of that, they surrounded the flammable black liquid with non-flammable black liquid to make sure that Daniel Day-Lewis didn't accidentally burn himself. Kremen said that it was, quote, tricky to get the two liquids to look the same. The original shooting plan was to start the fire, put it out, and then the next day they would light it on fire again for the night shots with more camera operators. Ellswood said, For the first night, we had designed several long shots that would take plain view from his tented outdoor office to the derrick, where he would cut the ropes and allow it to fall over. We are also planning to shoot another angle of plain view from the top of the derrick that would carry him to another camera. That was as far as we were supposed to go on night one before putting out the flames. Then on the second night, we were going to shoot a number of other angles to suggest different points of view, including a more controlled view of the fire from over the actor's shoulders. However, Steve Kremen said that it might not be possible to put out the fire once it started, and he was right. Ellswick continues, The derrick had been treated, but it had been sitting in the hot sun for months, so it was dry as tinder. Once Steve and his guys started the fire, they couldn't completely extinguish the top part of the derrick, which was still smoldering. They were afraid it might collapse on its own, so we had to keep going and stage the collapse on the same night. As a result, we ended up not shooting a lot of angles we planned to get. It was frustrating and I was very angry at the time, but Paul is happy with the sequence. The matching became an issue though. Is it magic hour or is it night? Is the sky blue or black? How do we make all these shots fit together? We didn't have a lot of time to finish that sequence, so we couldn't be as careful about what we did and when. They were worried that if the top continued to smolder overnight, the derrick might collapse without them capturing it on film. It also didn't help that the day that they shot it happened to be particularly windy. You can see the flames and smoke being blown to one side. So they kept going to make sure they filmed the collapse. Day Lewis said, and There was no going back if we got the burning of the derrick wrong. We'd have been absolutely shagged. We had a good guy named Steve Kremen, who was strangely an ex-tennis pro. And he really just did everything right, thank God. You can feel this in the scene itself. Every time I see it, I tense up seeing this guy try to whack the stake out of the ground and he keeps missing. I imagine that it wasn't planned because method acting Daniel Day-Lewis seems to improvise running up to help and nearly gets whacked with the sledgehammer. Kremen explains what those moments were like, saying, We let the derrick burn for as long as we could before we had to pull it down. The crew kept filming while Paul let the actors try different things. He's a bit of a renegade and he wanted to play it out to the bitter end. I was standing behind him while the derrick was crackling and popping, and he kept looking back at me to make sure it was okay to keep going. Finally, I said, it's time. If we don't drop it, it's going to drop on its own. He wanted to try one more scene that took about two minutes, and I was sure we were going to lose the derrick. But he finally said, okay, drop it. We had the derrick hooked up to a crane with a couple of cables that allowed us to pull a weak knee out from under it. It dropped like a dream. Paul Thomas Anderson is a bit of a renegade considering that, for the night shots, he wanted the actual flames coming from the oil derrick's flame jet to illuminate the faces of the actors during the reaction shots. Usually, a reaction shot of an actor looking at fire would have simulated lights or a couple of small controlled flames just off camera, but this was not the case for this scene. They used Kremen's big flame jet and in some cases, quote, flamethrower-like devices. Using this intensity of flames meant that the crew had to wear flame-resistant suits, but the actors merely had their costumes flame-proofed, so the quote, grimaces on the actors' faces are genuine. Ellswit said, I could have lit those reverses completely artificially, but Paul often doesn't trust that kind of approach. He said, oh, no, it will be a lot better if we just set something on fire. So when you look at that scene, the color on the actors' faces is the color of burning gasoline. According to Ellswit, the closest actors were about 120 feet from the fire, which is still extremely hot, and his crew sometimes got within 60 feet of the flames for short amounts of time. 
It's amazing how they bring together all of the characters and locations around this giant oil blaze. It sort of reminds me of this scene in The Bridge on the River Kwai, where Shears is conversing in the infirmary while Nicholson and his men stand at attention in the background. There's certain advantages to being on the sick list. Director David Lean could have easily framed the scene without seeing the men in the background. But I really appreciate when filmmakers do things the hard way, because it really adds to the overall scope of the movie. Imagine Alec Guinness standing out in the heat while they film this dialogue scene over and over. The scene ends when Plainview's men wheel several barrels of dynamite into the flaming derrick. This was a real practice for extinguishing burning oil geysers. The exploding dynamite actually sucks all of the oxygen out of the area, allowing the flames to suffocate. Despite the film being about oil, There Will Be Blood was a carbon neutral movie, meaning that quote, for every dollar they spend on energy, they invested another dollar in sustainable energy projects. Are you like me and often find yourself endlessly scrolling through a streaming services catalog looking for something to watch? It's difficult when the bad and the good are all mixed together. Well, Mubi has solved this problem in a really unique way. Mubi hosts just 30 films, hand-selected by film lovers, not an algorithm, and they add a new movie every single day. Mubi hosts a variety of great movies, ranging from award-winning masterpieces and festival-fresh gems, to cult classics and those hard-to-find movies that you always keep an eye out for. What I love about Mubi is how they curate their releases into retrospectives, specials, and specific subgenres like apocalyptic movies. Right now, they have a special retrospective series of Takashi Kitano Yakuza movies. You know, the guy from MXC? Well, watch him keep the gritty Yakuza action genre alive with 2017's Outrage Coda. And then join the discussion in Mubi's community of film lovers. Try Mubi free for 30 days at Mubi.com slash CinemaTyler. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash CinemaTyler for a whole month of great cinema for free. Or join me on Patreon at the $5 level and get extended access to Mubi as a perk. Thanks for watching.